I'm Anna Karagati, the Group Editorial Director of World Screen. Thank you for joining us today. This promises to be a very informative and interesting session. We've all heard of Amazon, the online retail giant where so many of us, me included, buy books and products of all sorts. Beyond, beyond offering goods and merchandise of all kinds, Amazon Prime has been offering movies and TV programming. And earlier this year, Amazon Studios began developing original programming. As with all things Amazon, this studio is doing things a little differently, harnessing the power of the internet to reach out to talent. It's with great pleasure that on behalf of MIPCOM, I present to you Roy Price. Roy Price today heads up Amazon Studios, but earlier in his career, he was at Disney, where he ran TV animation series development. And you may have heard of some of the hit kids shows that came out of that, Kim Possible, Buzz Lightyear, House of Mouse. He then moved to McKinsey and Company, and a few years later, Amazon.com asked him to run their new digital video business. A couple years after that, Amazon Studios was founded. We've heard a lot of great keynote addresses in this auditorium, but I promise you that after hearing this one, you're going to view television and TV development in a different way. Ladies and gentlemen, Roy Price. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and thank you, esteemed partners, colleagues, and TV pals. Uh, by the way, this is the meeting for cocktail hour, and I am assured that if I run long, emergency drinks will be distributed in the room. Uh, so Amazon operates in 10 countries, and there have been 250 million, 215 million active customer accounts in the past year. Um, books, DVDs, music, electronics, auto parts, power tools. I hope you buy everything you need at Amazon, because we have broad selection and low prices. Um, we have subscription video services in the US, UK, and Germany. Uh, in the US, uh, it is part of Amazon Prime, which is a subscription that, in addition to having a fabulous video service, gives you two-day shipping on all your Amazon Prime purchases. Uh, it's an awesome program, and if you like, we can pause while any of you who are not already subscribed, subscribe. Uh, so Amazon Studios, we started developing original TV in April 2012, um, we recruited a team in LA of development executives and lawyers, uh, let's be honest, mostly lawyers uh, in development. Uh, so Amazon Studios develops original series for our subscription video services. Uh, so all of our shows will go into Prime or Love Film. Uh, Prime and Love Film have a lot of licensed content, they have exclusive content, like in the US, uh, Under the Dome or Downton Abbey. Uh, in the UK, Vikings. Um, and we at Amazon Studios developed the original shows. Uh, we develop original series because we hope to bring something special to uh, Amazon customers, develop with their preferences in mind. Uh, and we act as the studio at times. We also do co-pros, so we're super flexible. Our only priority is to develop great shows that Amazon customers will love. Rights we are not using, we want to license outbound, and uh, Sony is uh, going to represent us in that regard. Um, and we do kids' shows and adult shows. So today, I'm going to talk about what we're doing, why, and what's different about it. So we knew we wanted to develop and to have original, exclusive serial TV series for adults and engaging, entertaining, and educational TV shows for kids two to six. So we spoke to customers, we observed what they were into, and that's, what we wanted to, that's where we wanted to get. Um, but we wanted to develop in a way that took advantage of the realities and technologies of the contemporary world. So in Seattle, I work in a building called Day One, and with all the change we saw in the 20th century, cars, planes, penicillin, disco, uh, we're going to see equal change in the 21st century, in the digital world, and elsewhere. And the name of the building signifies that we're just on day one of that. We're still on day one on the internet. So as we thought about how to do de development in a, in a new way, um, we thought about three trends in particular 
to help us develop uh, in the contemporary world. One is that it's so much cheaper to create than it used to be. You know, um, most people in this room probably have a uh, video camera in their pocket or purse and can share videos and ideas on a large scale at zero incremental cost. Number two, it's so much easier to collaborate. It's easy for people to find other people with common interests and contribute some of their time, work together remotely. Even by devoting small portions of their time, people can contribute to large, significant projects like Wikipedia. Uh, and it's so much cheaper to communicate. You know, people share opinions, they share, they tweet, they like, they plus one, the retweet, tumble, comment, rate, and review. And so there's a flood of information and opinion that's always accessible, which affects the velocity of enthusiasm. In today's world, ideas and enthusiasms are more contagious than ever before. From Gangnam style to political movements, we see the new global virulence of, of uh, enthusiasm and ideas which can lead to the democratization of everything and really a, a different dynamic. The individual has more power than ever. Um, and in many areas of human endeavor, from advice to product development, to politics, um, to TV, we see a move from top-down, hierarchical, expert-driven processes to a creative, bottom-up world in some respects just sort of in, in the beginning, but you can see it emerging. And this really changes the world for artists. It changes the world for uh, writers and comedians and actors, and that means it really impacts TV, it impacts us. As Patton Oswalt recently said in Montreal, um, he said what's up there, um, our careers don't hinge on somebody in a plush office deciding to aim a little luck in our direction. Uh, there are no gates, they're gone. Um, well, at Amazon, our, our offices aren't that plush, but, uh, but the concept is quite right. Um, you know, it's a much more open world. And we've seen a large increase in self-distribution, uh, and, and we've created a platform for this in books with Kindle Direct Publishing, uh, which a lot of people are taking advantage of. In music, we've seen Justin Bieber and other people get their work out and get recognized. So we see a lot of this. And what we want to do in TV is devise a process that is really driven as much as possible by customers and creators themselves. And we just sort of facilitate this process. So it's about millions of people finding, getting behind great artists and great ideas all over the world. So as a practical matter, getting down to brass tacks, what do we do differently? Um, so number one, customer preferences. Uh, we know what the audience has liked in the past. And that's a helpful place to start. What are people responding to? Um, but you have to be a little careful in interpreting data. Uh, obviously, you can be too simplistic, conceivably. Um, like, Amazon customers like Breaking Bad, and they like Downton Abbey. So maybe we should develop a show about aristocrats in Surrey who are also crystal meth dealers, you know, which could be cool. Or we could like freshen it up by making it Coke. So it's totally different. Uh, it writes itself. So anyway, that would be probably, I'm going to suggest, too simplistic. Uh, another issue is that one has to perceive the difference between a show that is moderately popular with everyone versus a show that a smaller group of people passionately love. And when you're looking at the data, it's really important to be able to distinguish between those because I think in a digital on-demand world, the latter show where you have at least some people who have passion for it is actually much more valuable than the other show. We have tons of people who are like mildly meh to positive about it. Because there is, you know, in the on-demand world, of course, there's no hammock show. Uh, every show kind of, it has to be great or it's, or it's not that useful. Uh, so one thing you can see in the data, uh, I think interpreting it at a more meaningful level, is that what often works really historically are shows where a talented creator has a passionate vision for doing something original and interesting. That's kind of what works. Uh, so in the end, that's the most important thing. So what are we looking for besides that, just to be specific? I'll just go through a list. Yes, 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 absolutely, yes, 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 and definitely slides with single words. Uh, so. So, you know, if I knew exactly what it was, I would have written it last night. But it's 
you know, it's original and interesting. And I think, you know, as other people have said, we're in an interesting period in, in TV and, um, you know, traditional TV has had a different feel and pace from the conventions of movies, and movies had a different feel than theater. But many early movies were basically filmed theater. They had proscenium, and you kind of just shot people doing a play. And over time, people had to learn how to make movies in a, in a unique idiom. And over time, people had to discover how to make TV that was really op optimized for the situation of watching TV in your living room, on a TV, with act breaks, with commercials. Uh, and we expect the kind of TV we will do, which is watched mostly on a TV, but is accessed somewhat differently, is not scheduled, does not have commercials. You can watch, you know, people commonly watch three or four in a row. We'll probably find its own voice and idiom as well. And people are responding to characters, to reality, to depth. You know, the new TV is getting a bit more like the novel used to be. It's like Dickensian. Uh, especially Bleak House. Did you see that? That was really Dickensian. Um, but anyway, so we perceive this today, but it's really day one for all this discovery. Uh, the new TV idiom will be defined by people who will probably be a mix of people with experience in the more traditional TV storytelling and people who came up in the new way. Uh, and at Amazon Studios, our job is to develop the best possible environment for uh, these artists who are eager to explore what this can all mean. With that in mind, by the way, I want to jump into a video. Uh, this is a special, never-before-seen never sneak preview of one of our 11 pilots currently in production. Uh, so this is hot out of the oven. Um, comes from writer-director Jill Soloway, whom you may know from Six Feet Under and her recent movie, Afternoon Delight. Uh, the show is called Transparent, and it's about a family. It's about people, and it's about a family with some secrets. And let's run the clip of Transparent. Oh my god, please don't tell me you fucked them both at the same time. No, I'm actually not, because one of them is 17, so I'm not fucking her. The other one is an actual delightful human person, so I'm not fucking her either. I'm actually making very sweet love to her. You know, just sort of like connective, spiritual, creamy, no. double don't churned. Don't like that. Which one are you doing that creepy thing to? One on the left, the hair. Mm. Their band's actually good. You would like them. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. What are they called? Glitterish. Glitterish? Yes. Sounds like clitoris. No, it doesn't. This is the one where one woman stands in the back very seriously playing the triangle. Yeah, that's true. Yes. But it's actually really important to the sound. It is. Very important to the sound. Oh, my God. Dude, what do you have against the triangle? How do you feed these children you have over at your house? There's nothing in here. You should get some, you know, what they like, juice boxes and string cheese. <laughs> Tre treats for the kids. Are you done? Have you talked to Daddy? Yes. And? You think he has cancer? Kind of. Well, if he's really sick, he should start gifting his 12th hour year now. Why? Tax purposes, you know, it's just, anyways, don't worry about it. All right, so, um, so, whoops. Okay. So the second thing we do differently is we have open submissions. We have an open system for ideas. Anyone can upload a script to Amazon Studios. We've received 5,000 TV pilots and 20,000 movie scripts. By the way, we also develop movies. I'm not really talking about that today. Uh, but as you see, we work with top experienced creators in a fairly traditional way. Uh, but we supplement that with an open system. And we've received uh, submissions from 111 countries so far. I want to show you a clip from one of our pilots currently in, in production. Uh, this is a kid's show, Gordimer Gibbons, Life on Normal Street, was a script that came in. It was uploaded to our site about a year ago uh, by David Anaxagoras, who's a teacher. And um, uh, the script was really like a touching mix of, you know, it's got like a little Pete and Pete feeling or Stand By Me and something completely original. And so now David's uh, pilot has just been produced, and this is another uh, sneak preview. It was just being shot a couple weeks ago, so I think it's going to be a fun show. Here's a clip from Gordimer Gibbons.
We'll need protection for the eyes. Something for the fingers. What is it this time? I think it used to be an egg. Kick some frog butt. <sighs> All right. So, um, so I'm really happy with some of the pilots that are in production. Those are those are two of them. But it's not about me because the third thing that we do a little differently is get large scale multinational feedback on all the pilots. So, doing research is not new. Networks do it. Uh, theater world is always done out of town previews. Uh, doing it on this scale is newish. You know, I don't have to speculate how our shows will travel in Germany because uh, we'll have them tested in Germany, dubbed in German. Um, but you know, the value of an open-driven audience, audience, open, audience-driven system, from our point of view, is that game-changing shows are often rule-breaking shows. You know, groups of smart executives working together will tend to devise some rules, like you have to. Uh, they're helpful 99% of the time. But the game changers, you know, are often rule breakers, like from Hill Street Blues to Breaking Bad. You know, and rule sets, which are mostly right, nevertheless risk filtering those shows out. Um, and, you know, often, or mostly perhaps historically, I think very innovative shows have, have usually been greenlit by networks that were like doing really, really badly, and they were, or they're new, and they were frankly desperate. But, you know. <laughs> But, uh, but we'd like to have a process that is open to non-intuitive ideas, even when we're doing well. And uh, so the value of the open system is that it always has that double check with the actual audience. And as audience members, you know, we don't, we don't have rule sets. We're not like worried about our job. And uh, so we just have kind of a natural, unselfconscious reaction. So, um, so, you know, we think that'll be, that'll be very helpful to, uh, to just get on a continuous basis. And as, um, let's see, so the perfect system, you know, is probably driven either by one person, sort of a Walt Disney, Brandon Tartikoff visionary, or by all people. But there are a lot of integers in between one and all that are, that are probably problematic, you know, like 40. I think that's a bad integer. Uh, the risk is that you can get to the point where the only thing that can get through a committee of 40, you know, is something you've seen before. So I think it's helpful to go to, go to all people and get, see what the whole audience thinks. So the audience, um, let's see. So looking at the specific pilots uh, that we're working on, um, so the pilots are useful because they allow us to keep our decisions in touch with customer, customers' views. It allows us to be experimental and probably to work with a more diverse group in terms of development. You know, if you always go straight to series, you know, unless you're kind of a riverboat gambler, you've probably got a list of like 30 people that you, you're actually comfortable doing that with. I think you can open up a little more if you, if you do some experimenting and, and pilots. So ho hopefully we benefit from that. Um, perhaps one weakness of our current system is filtering. So we got 5,000 TV pilot scripts, but produced 14 pilots You know, in pilot season 1.0, and now we're producing 11 more. That's a lot of filtering that doesn't have a ton of customer input. So hopefully, in the future, uh, we can have a much higher percentage of incoming scripts actually be visualized, get some kind of visual treatment, because what, what people, audience members, uh, respond to is something visual. They're, they really, people don't want to read uh, scripts that much. That's why people get paid to read scripts. It's not as fun. People like to watch video. So, um, so we would like to help people visualize their pilots. And to help address this, um, I want to quickly introduce you to a tool 
Amazon Studios recently launched. It was uh, built in Scotland with um, uh, some great software engineers there, and it's called Storyteller. It's in beta, but it's available to everybody today, the Amazon Studios t site. And basically, the idea is you can put your script in, and it will help you today. It helps you create a storyboard. And um, this is in early stages, but you might imagine that we can keep making this better you know, and more powerful. So uh, this is an example of Storyteller, where somebody's script is on the left, and they're saying what scenes they want to make. And Storyteller will read the script and it'll say, you know, scripts are written in a very formal way. So it says interior cafe day, let's say. And it goes and say, says, OK, what pictures do I have of a cafe? And then it sees, you know, Billy and Sally are in the scene. So it puts them in the scene. And then it focuses on the assets. You focus on the emotion of the scene, the shots, et cetera. Right now, dialogue is just expressed through, um, through captions. But, um, but it's evolving. So you can always change the backgrounds. You can recast uh, very easily, much easier than in real life. And uh, you can modify wardrobe and so on. So the interesting question, I think, is what if in the future, instead of producing 25 pilots a year or so, you know, we could have 25,000 pilots a year? That would be exciting. That's, that's I think, uh, an interesting possible outcome. So, uh, pilot season 1.0, we tested um, some elements of this development process in April uh, of this year. We posted 14 original pilots on Amazon.com and uh, Amazon Instant Video and Love Film. Uh, we received customer feedback and behavioral data to decide which shows we should p pick up. And you know, the, the, it's not just like you walk in Tuesday morning and the computer tells you which shows to order or it tells you that it ordered four shows overnight, but, but a lot of the data is very helpful. You still have to apply human judgment, but, uh, but it's good to check and see what people think. So pilot season 2.0 is currently underway. We've sampled a couple of the shows today, and uh, we have a total of 11 shows that will premiere in Q1, and uh, six of the, five of them are grown-up shows, six of them are for kids. And I think they're starting off really well. Hope you'll like them. Let me know. Um, coming in 2014, in the spring, our kids lineup will launch. Um, I want to say we're very excited about our kids lineup. Uh, we worked with uh, Dr. Alice Wilder in New York to, to talk about how their shows could be educational and super entertaining. They're doing some, I think, very interesting work there. Creative Galaxy is. Um, an animated interactive art adventure series from Angela Santomero of Blue's Clues. And um, that's a picture of me at Burning Man, actually. Uh, no, it's not. It's one of our new shows called Tumble Leaf, which is about a small blue fox who lives in the woods and hangs out with his, uh, with his friends. And they discover adventure and friendship and love at every bend in the path. And uh, came to us in Bix Picks in Los Angeles. And they're doing some beautiful stop motion animation. Anne's Droids is about Anne, a young scientist, and her friends. And in her dad's junkyard in the backyard, she builds androids, and they get into adventures. And it's, it's very cool and fun um, from JJ Johnston. And um, that one's like a straight up co-pro. So as I said earlier, you know, we do all kinds of different deals, and that, that's a different format. So uh, this fall, we're going to premiere our first two shows, both of which are half hours. I want to show you, before I wrap up, a little sample of each. Uh, the first one, in alphabetical order, is uh, Alpha House, which is a comedy about four senators living together in Washington, DC, in a rented house in the US, uh, where apparently this is a real thing, where if you're elected representative, you're like from Missouri, whatever, you have a house there. People don't buy like a second house in DC. They move to DC, they've been elected, and like they get roommates and stuff. So it's a real thing, and this is about four senators who live together. Came to us from Gary Trudeau, who created Doonesbury, really knows Washington. It stars John Goodman, Mark Consuelos, uh, Matt Malloy, and Clark Johnson, and will feature appearances by Cynthia Nixon, Amy Sedaris, and Wanda Sykes. So it's been a really fun uh, season. We've shot about half of it. Let's get a little sample of Alpha House. Oh. 
Okay. So, one more reason why you should make the trip to Afghanistan. I wasn't aware of even one. The interview with that guy running against you, Hickok. How did you see that? It was local. Christless, nothing's local anymore. Even I know that. It went virile. YouTube. Shit. Point is, if you're holding pressers in front in Kandahar, Hickok can hardly call you out for being a faggot. He wasn't calling me a faggot. He sure as hell wasn't calling you Arnold Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger's a faggot. What are you talking about? Like 20 women have accused him of sexual assault. Never proven. Look, Lewis, you need to go, man. Get yourself photographed holding a saw or an M2 or something. What are they? Light arms. Right. You've never handled a gun in your life, have you? <laughs> How could you miss that? How could you fucking miss Give that? Give me a break. I'm shit-faced. Jesus, Gilgeon! It's only 20 feet away, for Christ's sake. Ah! Fuck me! God, must be the sighting. All right, so Alpha House and the second show we're premiering, uh, also in alphabetical order, is called Betas, a group of young people doing a startup in Silicon Valley. Uh, so you can see the Greek letter pattern here. Alpha House and Beta is obviously next season. We're going to pick maybe Delta Force, Gamma Ray, whatever you have. Uh, that, that was unintentional. So uh, let me show you a quick clip of Betas, and then we'll move to the Q&A. And that is George Murchison. Don't let the flute and sandals act fool you. The guy's got a mind like Moby. Like, bald man is mopey. <laughs> Thank you, Moby. Thank you so much. OK. We got this. Uh, Mr. Murchison, Trey Barrett. This is my partner, Avinash Dagavi. We actually met at Social Fresh last year. Ah, uh, yes, Barrett, got your emails, all 20 of them. Yeah, if we could just get five minutes of your time working on something, I think you're going to. Got a party gonna... to host, kid. You want to talk shop? Call my office Monday morning, set something up. I wonder how 50 Cent would assess that effort. Bad. He would assess it bad. Yeah, I get it. It was not good. I... All right. So thanks very much. Um, Anna is going to come out. We're going to do some Q&A over there. So, uh, so I'll just go over there. OK. Oops. Well, ah. there's a lot to talk about. That oh, was good. a lot of food for thought. Um, I thought since you started at a traditional studio, right. Disney, then you went into McKinsey, right. and then online, and now you're back into development, but for, should we call it a different kind of studio? Right. I was wondering, from your perspective, um, how has this transition occurred from, audience, from networks and studios sort of imposing programming on you know, couch potatoes who had nothing, no power to do other than just receive what a, a channel is giving? to consumers now having taken control of their entertainment choices. What's sort of, what's been your view of this and where is this leading? You know, in general, I do think we'll see individuals and consumers empowered more and more in many ways as we leverage the connectivity and communication power of, of the internet. And, uh, you know, I mean, networks always, I don't, I don't mean any of this, by the way, shouldn't be construed as, as being critical of the traditional development process because Obviously, a lot of great shows come out of it, and uh, networks do a lot of research, and they try to be really customer-led, but, uh, but hopefully we can get something incremental out of uh, doing the really large-scale, you know, global. Uh, I do think it's a little different if you ask a million people around the world about a show versus like 50 people in Tarzana. Uh, I think you can get more out of it, so it'll be interesting to see where that 
where that goes. But not to take anything away from the from the, this new thing about getting audience feedback, it's kind of been around for a while, right. hasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, yes. I mean, in theater, obviously, you'd open a show in Boston, and and you know, people would be very eager to see what does the audience actual actually think. I don't think you can rely on you know mass feedback to like solve your second act story problem. I, th I think that's looking to it for the wrong thing. But to just get a sense of are people digging this show or are people not digging this show, I think it's helpful. And I think it's something people have done for quite a while. I, I imagine even before Broadway, you know, Homer on the ancient Greek right. hillside probably reacted if people were obviously nodding off, you know, in the second <laughs> book of the Iliad or whatever. So, yeah. And, and certainly movies have been tested for a long, long time. Yeah, too. unfortunately, typically after you've made the movie, so yeah. it's like a little late. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> and there's a there's a famous New Yorker cartoon, well, famous to me, of uh, and it, it's like four guys sitting in the audience with cigars, looking at the screen. It says the end of thirty million dollars. <laughs> that that was several years ago, when you know that was typical movie budget. Um, tell us a little bit how. Programming an uh, on-demand online service is different from programming a linear network. Sort of what are the different considerations you have to take into account? You know, I think there's a lot of analysis that used to go into the exact sequence of shows and what day they come out and having one thing lead into another and so on that, that you know, is not a part of the new world. You know, each show is... You can cross-promote, but I think each show is a little more of an island, and you have to reach out to uh, customers you know, specific for that show. You know, people who like Gary Trudeau, people who like John Goodman. You know? um, so it's not about a sequence. People have to reach out and discover that particular show. And um, another thing that's very different about the marketing is that when you're releasing online, so that the show is going to be available, like let's say it comes out at midnight on a particular day. Well, if people come at 1 a.m., it's still there, or 10 a.m., or, or five days later. So we don't really care that everyone has to watch it on day one. So the, the marketing and PR strategies uh, become very different. Like if, if the day before you launch the show, demand was zero, but then, and I don't intend for this to happen, but like theoretical right, right. example, just to be clear. Uh, if demand was zero the day before, like it actually doesn't matter. That's not a problem, you know, because we don't really care if people watch it on day one or day five or day 30 or whatever, so long as they eventually discover it and they feel really engaged and, and you know, they like the show. That's so it really affects marketing and outreach to customers. You, just from looking at Alpha House, there's some pretty A-list talent that's uh -huh. involved in that. Um, what was it like, I don't want to use the word convincing, but you know, how did you approach talent for something that is going to air online as opposed to right. you know, a major cable or, or broadcast network? Well, you know, different people kind of had different points of view. I think today it's, um, you know, people are pretty into it and it's not like a problem. Um, you know, a year and a half ago, maybe you had to explain, like, where people are going to watch the show, and, like, is this YouTube? Right. And, like, no, it's not YouTube, um, you know? But, uh, but I think things have changed pretty rapidly, and I, I think people get, you know, what the concept is. And uh, um, so we've actually seen a lot of enthusiasm, as you see in the cast, and... Right. And other talent writers and directors and producers, like people seem to dig it and they want to, want to be involved. And there's that other online service that will remain unnamed right now, who certainly has put out some quality shows that has probably helped yeah, it's the, all, yeah, the creative it's helpful. community I understand so. that this is another. Outlet. I think it's helpful. Right. Yeah, I think everybody's kind of on board, and yeah, so you don't encounter that much. But you know, that's always the curve. You know, in the very beginning of digital video, you know, you had to go you know, and talk to studios and stuff about like, well, we want people to download the movies. And there's also, there's always a little, a little curve. I've been in a couple of meetings where people said, well, one thing I'll tell you for sure is nobody's ever gonna download our movies. Well, uh, so, you know, things evolve and the right. market evolves right. and, and so on, so. 
So you, let me see if I've understood this correctly. You have data from the people who already watch Amazon Prime, so you know what your customers like and don't like. Right. Then you've put these pilots up and you've received reaction from anybody who wanted to watch them. Yeah. And then you have professionals in the studio who have been producing and writing and directing. Give us an idea of how you, that's a lot of information. Right. Is it more than what traditional channels have available in trying to hit the bullseye of what viewers want, A, and B, how do you take all of that and stir it together and, and make your final decision? Yeah, I think there are a lot of data points, and over time, I think we'll have a better and better understanding of which data points are predictive. Um, so you do it the first time, it's, it's, uh, you're, you're learning more and more. And, uh, but I think there's a lot of interesting information. You know, how much do people like the show? Do people you know, share with others their enthusiasm for the show? Um, and uh, what can you tell me at a high level generally about who likes or doesn't like the show, what other kinds of shows do they like maybe? And, um, but then still there's a human element. You know, what do we know about this show? You know, or the team behind the show? You know, do we think this show uh, really is going to be sustained, or is it kind of a great pilot without a show? I mean, hopefully we'd never make a pilot like that, but let's just say that we did. You right, know? right. Um, so you have to bring that sort of thing to it and then, and then look at it all. So there's the numbers part, and that, that really is important. And um, uh, sometimes what happens, though, is, is the numbers kind of group the shows into clusters. And so there's like these are you have getting a great response, Mid response, low response, and you, you still have to make some choices there. So you don't just come in and have the computer tell you, you know, right. I agree right. that three and shows. Does your gut also still play a role in this? I mean, just sort of. I think inevitably, you know, right. you, you think like, because, you know, TV series are, are not just about pilots. You know, right. you're hoping for 50, 100 episodes, right. and it's like, well, is this a show that can continue to evolve and grow? and and be engaging you know, for a long time. Is this a team that can execute on that? And so you're always thinking about that stuff. So it's, it's inevitably, it's, it's kind of a hybrid system. It's right. not a totally different system. Do you, do you envision the day when you have lots of series up that I watch a drama, and as with the books on Amazon, if you liked this, then maybe you'll like this, this, and this. Is, is that one way that you're going to be introducing new shows to your customers? Oh, yeah. I mean, I imagine that day coming in just a few months, you know, I mean, yeah, like, that'll yeah. be very soon. I mean, yeah. we'll certainly use uh, recommendations, you know, but, I mean, those things are entirely automatic. Like, I don't sit around and tell the it, recommendations what to do. Algorithms do that, It's totally right? yeah. just an algorithm. So, yeah. uh, hopefully, you know, Betas and Alphouse will we'll get into a lot of the recommendation engines uh, that we have, um, but we, you know, we'll have to see. Right. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, oh. I'm going to squeeze in one more okay. because children's is near and dear to my heart. Yeah, sort of, what's the too. philosophy there? Because it's a crowded market, um, but still, what what do you want to offer? And it's not just preschool. You're doing school age children. Well, as now well, right? we're getting into six to eleven uh, pilot season one point. I was just preschool, so we greenlit three shows that are kind of at various points in the two to five, two to six spectrum. Uh, great kids uh, programming is really important to parents. It's really important to kids. Uh, we see, you know, people are, people love it and use it a lot on like Kindle Fire, and uh, and I've always loved kids TV and came from that. So, so, uh, so I want to come up with a great strong preschool lineup that is both educational and entertaining, but also has uh, certain experiences around the show in addition to watching the show. And it's really able to engage kids and, uh, and offer something about education and development in addition to having great characters that kids love. And I think if we could do that for Amazon customers, I, I think they'd be psyched about that. And then um, in the next round of pilots, we'll have four kids to six to 11 shows. So we'll be going into that. And uh, that's, that's probably more about entertainment. Um, uh, well, they're both about entertainment, but it has less of an educational right. focus, but uh, hopefully we'll have a lot of fun there as well. Great. I'm sorry we have to... There we are. It. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, okay. Anna. Thank you. And thank thanks, you everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you.